Hey you guys, time once again for Flickers of Fear, another movie review, and because it's still July, it's still Giallo July, so we're going to be talking about another Giallo movie. So let's talk about the Italian director Luciano Ercoli, hopefully I'm pronouncing that sort of right. Um, he's probably not, you know, a household name in the giallo genre in the way that, you know, Mario Bava or Dario Argento or even like Sergio Martino are. But uh, he did make, I mean, he did some spaghetti westerns and stuff like that, but he did make um, at least three pretty well-regarded uh, giallo films. One of these was Forbidden Photos of a Lady Above Suspicion, which I may or may not get to later in the month, uh, Death Walks at Midnight, and the movie that we're going to be discussing today, which is called Death Walks on High Heels. So this movie came out in 1971 and was one of a bunch of uh, collaborations that uh, Luciano Ercoli did with his wife, who was a Spanish actress by the name of Nieves Navarro. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Although in this movie, she's actually credited as Susan Scott. This movie is also one of the last film appearances of an American actor by the name of Frank Wolf, who actually uh, took his own life later the same year that this came out. I believe it was in December. He actually like slashed his own throat in a hotel room, uh, sadly. So I don't know if this was actually his last film appearance because I think they did release a couple of movies posthumously that he had made, um, but this is definitely one of his last uh, film appearances. Now, Death Walks on High Heels has a pretty low body count, <laughs> at least as far as Giallo movies go. Um, only three people die in it that I remember. Uh, at least one of the kills is pretty gruesome, the other one's not so much. And I will say too that it plays out a little bit more like maybe like a heist or an espionage type movie than a murder mystery, but it does still kind of retain enough of that uh, giallo charm that we all love so much uh, that makes it a pretty entertaining watch for, you know, fans of the subgenre. So the movie starts out with a bang, uh, or actually more like a stab. <laughs> so there's this eye patch wearing dude, and he's kind of like acting shifty on a train. You can tell that he's kind of like up to something or whatever. Um, but then like somebody comes to the door of his cabin and stabs him to death. Like the guy that stabs him is this dude wearing like a black ski mask or uh, balaclava, whatever they call it. Um, and he has these really, really intense, like bright blue eyes, which is weird because that was also kind of a thing in all the colors of the dark. Maybe, maybe those bright blue contact lenses were just like all the rage in Italy, like in the early seventies. Cause it seems like there's a lot of Giallo movies that have like the killer with these like bright, bright blue eyes that are like contact lenses. And they actually are contact lenses in this too. Like they're not supposed to be, the guy's eyes are not supposed to naturally look like that, which I'll get into. So the guy, the eye patch wearing guy on the train who got murdered, uh, we learn later on was actually an international jewel thief by the name of Ernest Rochard. And the man who killed him was actually looking for some diamonds uh, that he had, let's call it liberated, uh, during a recent robbery. But the murderer doesn't find the diamonds. Like he goes all through his stuff and he can't find them. So after this opening sequence, then we cut to Paris where Rochard's daughter, who is a French exotic dancer named Nicole, is being hassled by the cops who have a suspicion that she might know where the stolen diamonds got off to. Like maybe her dad, like, you know, passed them to her at some point or whatever. So she tells them, look, I haven't heard from my dad in ages. We don't talk. I don't have no idea where the loot is. Just leave me alone. Um, she's also like pretty indifferent to the fact that, like, <laughs> that her dad got murdered. They're basically like, yeah, he got murdered. She's like, man, whatever. You know what I mean? She's like, she doesn't even react at all, which I think is like kind of funny. So Nicole has this boyfriend who I think lives with her. Yeah, I guess he's like, so he's like a live-in boyfriend. His name is Michelle. And he appears to have some insecurities about not having a job and having to rely on Nicole's stripper income uh, to pay for his excessive drinking, among other things. But that's usually what he's doing. Uh, she tells him that she doesn't mind. Uh, she loves him anyway, but it's quite clear that he feels very emasculated by this situation and takes it out on Nicole by kind of being a dick to her pretty much all the time. 
which, you know, that's kind of par for the course for dudes in Giallo movies. <laughs> They're all kind of jerks. So we get to, there are several like long sequences of Nicole kind of shaking her moneymaker, you know, uh, at a couple different performances. I guess she works at a couple different uh, clubs. She's kind of like the main attraction there. Uh, the first of these, I'm going to say problematic alert, uh, the first performance is her, uh, it's very cringe inducing, where she's covered in very dark spray tan and she's wearing a wig that kind of looks like a short afro, like was kind of in the style uh, in the 1970s. And after this, like she has kind of a feather boa and she's like wiggling around and whatnot. And then like afterward, when she's in her dressing room, like Michelle comes in there and <laughs> says to her, that I think this is a direct quote, I love when you're all black. <laughs> and then like, that like he's sensuously like take it off like the all over black face like with cold cream it's something else i have to tell you but yeah so that's like the first performance so yeah 70s uh there's also like another one which is like a lot less problematic where she's just wearing this kind of like gold headdress thing and like shimmying around in a cage or something like that so at both of these shows, the, we see that Nicole evidently has a super fan or a stalker, you know, depending on how you look at it. He's this kind of distinguished looking older dude who does things like, I mean, he just kind of sits there and leers. I don't know if he's really leering. He just kind of like looks at her like she's a big cupcake or something like that. And, uh, he's, but he does stuff like lets himself into her dressing room, like without, when she's not in there, buys her big bouquets of roses, kind of gets all up in her face when she's, you know, trying to live her life or whatever. He's a little bit awkward and like a little bit overbearing. Like you can tell that he's trying to be like, trying to appeal to her by being like a little bit, oh, I'm so harmless and pitiful like type of thing. Uh, she does handle this pretty well, uh, all things considered. Like I said, it's probably like it's an occupational hazard, I imagine. So she's kind of gotten used to it. Also, while all of that is going on, uh, Nicole is also getting a couple of what f at first appear to be like prank phone calls in which a guy who's talking through like a voice synthesizer thing threatens her. Like at first she just thinks it's some loser, but like later on, it's obviously somebody that knows her and knows who she is. So again, because she's a stripper, she probably gets this kind of crap all the time, uh, you know, and she's kind of used to this bullshit. So she handles that like a pro as well. So that night after these performances, uh, her boyfriend, Michelle, gets drunk again and starts an argument again about how Nicole's ass wiggling is paying his way in the world and he's not like a big fan of it. So I was just like, so get a job. I don't really know what's preventing him. He he kind of says a few times, it's like, I can't get the job I want, but I'm not really sure like what job he wants exactly and why he's having such a hard time getting it. But yeah, but I don't know. Like he just keeps taking it out on her, like I said. So they have a big fight. He flounces off to do Lord knows what. And then after he leaves, the scary uh, bright blue eyed dude with the ski mask crawls in Nicole's apartment window and he has like a straight razor and he's like, look, I'm just going to cut you to fucking pieces if you don't tell me where the diamonds are. So this is obviously somebody that knows who she is. Uh, again, she insists, look, I don't know where the diamonds are. I haven't like talked to my dad, nothing like that. But the guy is kind of like, yeah, you absolutely do know where they are. And if you don't tell me, like, I'm going to come back here and just like cut you into mincemeat. Uh, and that's, you know, so he's like threatening her. So obviously Nicole is terrified by this, uh, series of events. So she flees to wherever it was that Michelle holed up in, like after his little tantrum. And even though he doesn't believe her about the potential murderer after her telling her, oh, you must have dreamed it. <laughs> thanks a lot, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I didn't dream it, but okay, thanks. Thanks for your support. Uh, they basically just like kiss and make up. However, things are looking a little less rosy the next morning. Nicole is going through the medicine cabinet looking for aspirin or whatever. And she discovers a pair of bright blue contact lenses in the medicine cabinet. So convinced that these belong to Michelle and, you know, subsequently he's, she thinks that he must be the one that's been like threatening her all this time. She decides she needs to get the hell out of Paris like right now. So remember the dude, like the super fan that was like coming to see all her strip shows? She decides she's going to utilize this guy thinking, I don't know, like maybe he's a sucker or something like that, but she just like kind of wants a way out of town. So, 
you know, and he's been mooning after her. So she's like, okay, well, I'm just going to take this opportunity. So it turns out that he's a British surgeon by the name of Dr. Robert Matthews. And so Nicole basically like comes up to him and is like, hey, I need to get out of town. You know, Calgon, take me away. And he's just like, okay, can do. So they actually just jet off to London. She doesn't tell anybody where she's going. She doesn't tell Michelle, obviously, because she thinks he's, you know, a potential murderer. And I guess she doesn't tell her workplace or anything. She's like, okay, we're going to go to London. And then there's kind of like a shopping montage where, uh, where the doctor like buys her all these sexy outfits and boots and wigs. She wears like a lot of wigs in this. Uh, like I said, she's, you know, the actress that plays Nicole is the director's wife. And he put her in a lot of movies, you know, cause obviously he thought she was hot, which she is. Uh, so, you know, you get to see like a lot of her boobies and like her trying on different outfits and stuff like that. So it's very like European vacation, like that part of it. So Dr. Matthews then installs her in this kind of remote seaside cottage near a small fishing village, which is obviously supposed to be in rural England, uh, but actually looks more like Italy because it is. But you know, what are you gonna do? Now, the doc tells her that he's married, but that his wife won't divorce him, and also that his wife is the one with all the money, which seems to be something of a recurring theme in this movie. But he reassures her that his wife, whose name is Vanessa, doesn't know anything about this cottage, so it's fine, like, you'll be safe there. Uh, the town seems kind of, like, nice enough, but everybody in the town is kind of weird and shady, and every time, like, Nicole goes to the pub or, like, whatever, they're all, like, staring at her suspiciously, because they know that, like, some weird shit is going on, like, between her and the doctor. He introduces her in the town, like, as his wife, but I think everybody's just like, yeah, right, <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. So, the shadiest motherfucker of all these shady motherfuckers is this guy named Hallery, who actually he has a wooden hand, I think. But I thought it's, that doesn't really, like, I think they mentioned that, but I don't think it factors, like, much into the plot later on. Maybe they just said it because, like, ooh, spooky, I don't know. But he has, like, a wooden hand, and he's the guy that looks after the cottage when Dr. Matthews is not there. Also, uh, somebody is watching Nicole get naked in the cottage, like, through a telescope, so there's that. Though, honestly, I really do wish that women in Giallo movies would learn to close their fucking blinds. I mean, I'm not blaming the victim, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's like, don't be prancing around naked if you don't want people, like, looking in the fucking, it's a Giallo movie, come on, close your blinds. So, elsewhere, uh, Dr. Matthews has had to travel back to the city, back to London, to do some eye surgery on a guy named Smith, uh, in what is actually a pretty squirm, if you're like, you know, if you kind of squirm like watching people fuck around with people's eyes, yeah, this one was a little, <laughs> a little rough. Like nothing bad happens, but he's actually doing, it actually looks like, I mean, it was making me really nervous, like for the actor on the receiving end of it, because you could tell that it's like, oh, I got this, I'm just going to scrape all this stuff like off your eyeball or take off the fucking cataract or whatever the fuck he was doing. And it looks like they're really doing it. I mean, it's not special effects or anything. So I was like, oh my God. It's like, hopefully that guy doesn't sneeze and just click right in this fucking eyeball. Yikes. So after the surgery is finished, and Smith is all bandaged up, like his eyes are all bandaged. This unknown individual wearing black high-heeled boots kind of like pops into the room and shoots Dr. Matthews in the chest. And now he actually does end up surviving like the, the shot, but they don't really know who did it because Smith, who obviously heard the shot but couldn't see Dick because his eyes were all bandaged over, he tells police that he thought the killer was either a very determined woman, like the way they were walking, or it was a man like kind of treading heavily, but wearing women's shoes because he could tell what kind of uh, shoes it was. Now back at the fake English cottage, uh, whoever has been spying on Nicole through the telescope actually sees a woman dressed in like a black, long black coat, like talking to her. Nicole appears to know this person, like she, you know, she let her in like willingly and everything like that. But the person, you know, with the telescope can't tell who it is because there's like a lamp in front of the woman's face. So the mysterious woman like actually throws some money at Nicole and then leaves. And then Nicole seems to get like really upset, like she lays down on the couch or whatever. And then not too long after this, Nicole actually ends up disappearing. Now, from this point forward, the plot thickens big time. Uh, a couple people turn up dead. I'm not going to say who because it's spoiling it. And everybody in this town and a few people outside of it seem to know a lot more about these murders and the diamonds than they're letting on. 
Inexplicably, Michelle, the boyfriend who, uh, who Nicole just like picked up and left without telling him, he shows up in town out of the blue. I guess he's uh, found out where she's at. He drinks a shitload in the pub and then throws up on a cop in what is actually a really funny scene. Well, I guess like he's super drunk and then like the cops want to question him. And so the lead cop like gives him this concoction with like coffee with like, it looks like he put lemon juice in it. And I guess it's like supposed to like an Ipecac or something. So it's supposed to like induce vomiting, uh, which it does. And so, yeah, he goes to like to the window and barfs and there's like a cop down there. So he barfs on the cop's hat. But yeah, so the cops um, are suspicious of this like, oh, you're the boyfriend and you turn up all of a sudden. And you know, so he's like a suspect also also there's like a really weird scene this is neither here nor there but there's a really weird scene in which the cops are questioning the owner of a commercial ice house because there's something to do with like ice and like body and time of death and somebody like trying to stall decomposition by like soaking the or soaking like you know uh putting ice on the body or whatever so they go question this guy who owns a commercial ice house and this guy is like i see this a lot in like italian movies from this era there's always like not always but there's often like one like really like gay stereotype and so that's this dude's role in this movie so he's like so gay apparently that he can't even like answer police questions without sitting he's just like sitting with a rose is like yeah that's right and you, you know it's like he's just like sniffing a rose the whole time just for no reason just because gay that's what gay, that's what gay men do i guess they just like sit there and sniff roses while cops are trying to ask him a question about who bought some ice or something like that uh he even like openly hits on the younger cop who's like the assistant to the older grizzled cop uh and the older cop just kind of like takes and he's trying like yeah that'll happen yeah we'll we'll let him come by himself next time since you like him so much and then he calls the guy he goes good day senora and i'm just like okay whatever 70s you so crazy now as i mentioned this movie is kind of less on the horror end of the giallo spectrum and more on the crime and espionage end uh you know there's kind of lots of double crosses backhanded dealings everybody's a suspect sneaky maneuvering it's all kind of that kind of stuff going on it's it's a very very convoluted plot and like I said, everybody has got some, like, shit to hide. Now, there are a handful of deaths. Like I said, I think there's only three. But really, only one of them is all that brutal. And that one is actually, like, pretty brutal, like, with the, you know, slash. And I think they even, you know, get, like, a Glasgow smile and everything. Uh, the first one is basically just a dude getting his throat slit. Like, not even. It's just kind of like he just goes, Zoop, and then, you know, like a shaving cut. And then the second one actually takes place mostly off screen. And we only see the aftermath, which which like isn't even bloody. Um, there is a lot of nudity though, and there's a lot of kind of stripper-esque writhing and things like that. So if that's your bag, then uh, you'll probably get your money's worth out of this one. Um, you know, it's not the best yellow I've ever seen, but it's still pretty solid. Uh, it's not as hyper stylized or as violent as some of the more kind of like beloved genre staples, obviously, but it's still like a pretty enjoyable mystery with lots of twists and turns uh, and it never wears out its welcome. It actually had like a couple of twists and turns in there that actually I really didn't expect, especially like one big one, like I said, that I don't really want to spoil um you know somebody that died that you don't expect to die we'll just like say that like that um but yeah so this is absolutely worth watching uh if you're you know like i said it's probably not in the top tier but it's like a tier or two down uh and if you like just kind of like crime and mystery type uh espionage type stuff then you'll probably be into this one so that'll do it for this flickers of fear continuing on with giallo july and i will see you guys on the next one bye